Good morning. It's 11 o'clock. I'm going to probably stray away from the mic, but I just wanted to use it to get your attention. Uh, thank you for coming this morning. Thanks to B-Sides Rochester for letting me be here. Uh, my name is Jeff Mann. I am uh, currently an information security consultant advisor, but I do a few other things. Can you guys hear me if I walk away? Yeah. Yeah. I sometimes project, but sometimes I mumble. So I'm going to just raise your hand in the back if I start uh, mumbling. Um, if you, in case you don't know me, uh, I've been in this business uh, for about, I, I credit it about 37 years, uh, but technically more like 35. Raise your hand if you were born 1986 or later. I've been doing this as long as you've been alive. <laughs> and that makes me feel old. Um, <coughs> just real quickly, I work for a company called Online Business Systems. They're paying for me to be here. Definitely not a marketing slide. I, I just have to give them credit for letting me be here speaking. They believe in what I do, which is teaching, educating, trying to pass on the useless knowledge that I've accumulated over the last 37 years, hopefully to the next generation. I tell stories, and this is what this talk is about mostly. Um, I have to start first by apologizing, and this is actually going to be a twofold apology now, thanks to Jason Stout this morning. Uh, this is a story about the past. This is a story about how I got started in hacking and penetration testing. I happened to do it at NSA back in the 90s. And what I discovered when I started putting together this talk a few months ago is it was really hard to find screenshots and, and, and try to give you visuals of what we did back then. And then I heard Jason Scott talk this morning. How many people were at the keynote? Uh, and I suspect that I should probably redo this presentation after I spend too many hours getting distracted by all the games that are out on his archive <laughs> site, but I think he's probably got some stuff there that I could use, so that's a homework assignment for me. Um, I'm going to intersperse throughout this talk uh, some dates, and it's, it's mostly to keep you guys uh, hopping, active, uh, but also a little bit of trivia. For example, does anybody know the significance of this date? Shout it out. Anybody want to take a guess? Oh, don't raise your hand. you got to shout it out. No, it's the day Skynet became self-aware. <laughs> All right, so uh, the majority of this talk is going to be about the latter part of my time at NSA. Uh, I gave a talk a few years ago called Tales from the Crypt Analyst, which I have stickers for now. If anybody's into stickers, see me afterwards. Um, but just to, you know, to recap, if you, if you haven't heard my other talk, which is Tales from the Crypt, this is more Tales from the Crypt. Uh, I started out as a cryptologist at NSA. I was working on what at the time was called the InfoSec side of the house. The NSA at the time had offense and defense. Uh, and I started out on the defensive side, protecting uh, communications of our, our, of our customers, which was pri primarily the military. Uh, I did that for a while. I spent some time over at operations, actually, as a crypt analysis intern, battery to penetration testing, vulnerability assessments, so on and so forth. Um, as I said, my first talk, Tales from the Crypt, is mostly about what I did the first couple years at NSA. Uh, I have a lot to talk about, so I'm just going to very briefly recap that, just as a whet your appetite. You can find this talk out on uh, YouTube. Uh, probably my favorite version is uh, B Sides DC, I want to say 2006. 16, but, you know, Tales from the Crypt, Jeff Man, you should find it. Uh, I dealt with one-time pads primarily. Paper manual crypto systems back when I started at NSA in 1986. Uh, and very early on in my career, I had a customer come to me and say, you know, we're, we're working with these people that are in the field, spies, uh, and we communicate with one-time pads. Now, the guys in the field, they quite literally would have a one-time pad that was printed very small, like maybe on an inch, inch and a half pad of paper that they could hide in the heel of their shoe, make it easily concealable. But the guys that they were talking to back in controlled spaces and offices, what were called handlers or case workers, they had larger versions of the one-time pad. They also had this thing sitting on their desk that was kind of new, it was, it was a personal computer, an IBM PC, and they came to us and said, is there any way we could do this encryption, decryption thing? on the computer, because it's just sitting there. 
and it takes us hours and hours to uh, to do this process. And I thought, well, yeah, why not? I mean, it's just a simple algorithm. We do it in our head. That ought to be able to be written down in a computer program. So what ended up happening is I, I launched into what was an engineering organization at NSA uh, that built boxes. NSA built boxes, radios, little things where you know, plain text messages went in and ciphering code came out. Um, and it was an organization that built hardware and firmware. And the idea of doing something in software had never been done before at the time. Um, so there was rules to follow, and, and I, I mention this because as I look back on my career, it's like, oh, I was learning to be a hacker. I had the hacker mentality. I was in an engineering or organization that built hardware. I took all the hardware specs and rewrote them to try to make them as closely as possible applicable to software. I had to put it through an approval process. So at a young age, in my mid-20s, I'm standing in front of a bunch of middle-aged men in suits that were all engineers and, and physicists and really smart guys, and I was pitching something that had never been done before. And I actually got them to agree to let, let us do it. They, they also said, don't ever do this again. But to my knowledge, uh, this was the first software-based crypto system that NSA ever produced. It was simply taking a one-time pad, putting it on a floppy disk that could be put into a PC so that the encryption and decryption could happen in an automated fashion. Um, I'm going to find the program that, because uh, it's probably in the archive, but this was like a word processing program, and I drew, a, I redrew a Calvin and Hobbes cartoon, you know, pixel at a time, and you know, this is kind of like using paint. Paint is probably what I could think of today as the closest thing. Um, anyway, that's the first thing I did. This was me getting an award for, for doing this fabulous thing. That's what I look like with hair, and I, at some point in my life, I used to wear a suit. Uh, that was the first part of my career. And I realized at the time uh, that that was probably one of the coolest things I've ever done in my career. Was I've done, had a lot of fun since, but that was kind of cool. Uh, my second career is I became an intern and I went over to the operations side of the house. I was there during the first skirmish in the desert, which was called Desert Shield, Desert Storm, which was back in the early 90s. So I got, to do, I got the, a special award for that. Everybody that participated in it got this uh, certificate, and I think I got a cash award too. Um, but I had, I had started off site of Fort Meade, and I had to drive down and, and work at Fort Meade. Has anybody ever been to Fort Meade? If you ever get a chance to go to Maryland, go to Fort Meade, if for no other reason, they have a, a cryptologic museum there now, and a lot of the stuff that I used to work on is in the museum. The mainframe that I used to work on uh, is in the museum. It's a Cray computer. Uh, again, it makes me feel old to think that the stuff that I worked on was in a was, is now in a museum. Uh, but I earned certification as a crypt analyst. It's, it's, this is pretty much the only certification I hold. I don't know if it's really valid 26 years later, but uh, I am not a CISSP. I, I'm an old salt that has been doing this for a long time. Anyway, that's the past. That's the first, you know, fast forward, the first couple of years of my NSA career. My last tour as an intern, I went back to the opera, uh, to the infosec side of the house, the defensive side of the house, and I went to work for an organization called the Fielded Systems Evaluation. Uh, this organization came about because some smart person at NSA figured out the way that we do what we do on the operations side in terms of intercepting communications and messages from our adversaries and breaking some of these codes and ciphers and encrypted systems is very often we discover that the people that are using these systems don't use them properly. They, and see if this sounds familiar to any of you guys. Uh, we commonly break systems because systems are not changed from their default settings. These systems are sometimes broken because things like a one-time pad, which is key that it's supposed to be used one time and then destroy it, which if you do it that way and, and you aren't able to steal that key, it's cryptographically insolvable. It is perfect security for communication. Uh, but some people, uh, some of our adversaries, uh, in the interest of saving paper, I guess they were the green movement even back then, they might use a page of one time pad key for a week or a month and send multiple messages. As soon as you do that, you make it vulnerable to compromise and vul vulnerable from a cryptographic perspective to solving. Um, uh, default settings, uh, reusing key, things like that. And somebody decided, well, gee, 
we produce the, the best crypto in the world. We're NSA, we produce these little black boxes and these perfect systems. How do we know that our people are using it in the field correctly? So fielded systems evaluations came about and my project was to go out and look at this uh, radio, which is called the Park Hill. And I forget what it says there, I read the small print. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, it took, a, it took a phone call, an analog signal, and it converted it to digits, and then it was able to encrypt the digits and encode it in some way, send it, convert it back into an analog. And the person would sound like Donald Duck when you listen to it, but this was secure communication. So I had to do an evaluation of that. Um, but then this happened. Another seminal date in the history of our civilization. Anybody, take a guess. Give up. This thing called the NSA Mosaic Browser. Anybody re remember Mosaic? This is what it looked like. It wasn't the first browser, but it was the first commercially available free browser. Changed the world. That's why we're sitting here today doing all this stuff that we call cybersecurity now. Because the internet became publicly available. This happened. <laughs> is basically what happened. I was certified, if you happen to notice, it was in 90, 1993. The Mosaic browser came out in 1993. So this fielded systems evaluation had a, uh, had a branch within it that was focused on networking systems. And so a bunch of us guys that were kind of curious about networks and computers, and maybe we'd seen movies like this and we were kind of interested, uh, we got to work on you know, starting to look into hacking and how do you break computers and all this stuff that we know and do today. Um, back then, at the very beginning, you know, we weren't the first, but this was going on in, in, in the world, and the book on the left was really our Bible because Unix security was internet security back then. We didn't call it cyber, we called it pretty much internet security. Um, the book on the right, a very popular book in the time, written by two guys named Cheswick and Belovin, the story about how they, ha they, they caught people breaking into their systems and they wrote a book about, about it. But it, again, in those days, in the early days, it was internet security. And there was a bunch of us that were interested in it, so we started doing it. The government, as the government likes to do, if you've ever, anybody worked for the government, any branch, uh, any kind of bureaucracy like the government? No? That's amazing. I'm just pausing a minute because I don't think I've ever spoken to a group where they, at least they're not admitting to work for the government. So in the government, in a bureaucracy, in large organizations, one of the things that happens very often is you reorganize. You have to shuffle the coconuts to make, make it look like they're making progress. And so senior management at NSA decided, hey, this internet security thing is becoming big. We're the experts on communications, so we need to do something. So they reorganized. So they pulled a bunch of disparate groups together and, and formed this organization called the Systems and Network Attack Center. If you Google that, I think uh, eventually the SNAC, as we called it, put together uh, things similar to STIGs or, or, or uh, configuration standards. There's some recommended recommendations type documents on how to build things back then, uh, maybe in the mid 2000s. Google it, you might find something. Um, but basically, the organization was put together to uh, Fielded systems, fielded systems evaluations was part of it, but the idea was to become a center of excellence. Uh, you know, we're NSA, we're the brightest, smartest, you know, m most whatever you want to think, myth mythical people in the world, and we should be able to pull together and become experts in all this. So, uh, we assembled a team. As I said, there was a, a, several of us that were kind of interested in doing this, and we got swept into this thing called the snack. The guy that was running it at the time, the deputy director, he had this vision. He's like, all we need is a bunch of those you know, smart hacker types, get them together and, and we'll rule the world basically. Um, so this small group of us uh, in trying to figure out how to do this thing and do it in such a way that we could you know, not just do it for the fun and not even do it for the profit, but to do it as, a, as part of a mission uh, of NSA and especially the defensive side, uh, we took a road trip. We went to San Antonio, Texas. We went to something that at the time was called the Air Force Information Warfare Center. Why Air Force? Because the Air Force at the time, I don't know if it's still true today, they basically owned the networks. They were responsible for the network, for the government, for the, for the military anyway, for the DOD. So they were the IT of the, of the military, if you will. 
And they set up the, not only the first network operations center, they set up the first security operations center. And that was all part of AFWIC. And we'd heard about it, and we wanted to learn, so we figured we'd go to the best. Uh, we met a couple guys down there. We called them the captains. Uh, doesn't really matter who they are. The guy on the left, he actually died a year ago. The guy on the right, I actually, putting together this talk, tracked him down and got on the phone with him. And, hey, do you remember when we visited you back in, I think it was 95? And he's like, oh yeah, I remember that. And he, you know, they came and visited us at NSA. We used to invite people to come to NSA. People were like, NSA, I'm gonna come talk to NSA. Yes, so we would get all the luminaries and big name figures back in the day to come talk to us so we could learn. Um, those guys, uh, they very quickly got snatched up. Uh, they formed a group, they left the, the military, the wheel group. Anybody ever hear of the wheel group? It only lasted for like maybe a year. They were one of the first commercial, uh, you know, internet security, cyber security companies <laughs> out there, and they got acquired by Cisco. And, and Cisco's been acquiring companies to this day, and people still don't think of Cisco as a security company. Go figure. Um, sorry, I didn't get the chance to see that, so you can't see it. So San Antonio. Uh, we were at Kelly Air Force Base. They had an air museum, so we got to see planes. Uh, that was the U-2 spy plane, which had only been recently declassified, so we got to see it. It was kind of cool. Anybody know what that plane is? Desert Shield, Desert Storm, kind of won the war for us. Those are actually some of the people that I used to work with, and I put it very small so that they, none of them look like that anymore. Uh, the Alamo, one of the best things about the San Antonio, if you've ever been there, is you go to the Riverwalk, and you get introduced to the 46 ounce margarita. <laughs> <laughs> we, had, we, we went out there and we each had one. It was, it was a one drink evening and quite literally some of the guys were lying on the floor. I was driving a minivan and it, it was an interesting evening. And we bought one of those glasses and we took it back. Because what we learned at AFWIC primarily was the organizational, the physical structure. What do they call it? Feng, feng shui? of our office. We learned about the round table. Put everybody's desks in the corner and put a round table in the middle. So everybody's doing their research so that if they have a question, if they want to collaborate, we would call round table and everybody would spin their chairs, come in the middle and we would talk things out. So we had one of those glasses that we called the orb and we put it in the center of the table because we're trying to be hackers. We're trying to live the culture. We drank a lot of Mountain Dew. I don't think Red Bull existed back then. And uh, we filled the orb with Super Bowls. Uh, the little mini ones, and every once in a while, just to blow off steam, we'd get into Super Bowl battles and throw them at each other, and, and uh, it was fun times. Um, like I said, we needed our own space, so the office that we, that, that we created, uh, again, trying to live the culture, and so we nicknamed our space, and we called it The Pit. We thought we were being cool. It was actually a, 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 a spinoff of the old TV show, M.A.S.H., where the doctors in MASH, they lived in their, their tent and they called their tent the swamp. That's what the pit meant. Um, the pit exists. This is an aerial shot of buildings that are just out, just west of BWI Airport, or what are they called these days? I forget, uh, Thurgood Marshall Airport. Um, the pit was actually in this building, in that corner. And uh, the reason I bring this up is a couple years ago, this book came out called Dark Territory. Anybody have ever heard this book, read this book? In this book, in the fourth chapter, which is entitled Eligible Receiver, there is this paragraph, which I need to dramatically read to you. <laughs> the NSA had a similar group called the Red Team. It was part of the Information Assurance Directorate, formerly called the Information Security Directorate. It was information security at the time. Uh, the defensive side of NSA, stationed in Spanish, which they spelled wrong, it's F-A-N-X, the building out near Friendship Airport, which is BWI. Uh, during its most sensitive drills, the red team worked out of a chamber called the pit, which was so secret that few people at NSA knew it existed, and even they couldn't enter without first passing through two combination locked doors. So anyway, we're famous, because we were the guys that were in an office, we called it the pit, and somehow it exists, it exists in folklore to the point where it made it into a book. So I'm a, one of the original founding members of the pit. But what were we doing? We were trying to learn how to become pen testers. We're red teamers. We didn't call ourselves red teams at the time, but we were like, well, you know, let's break into networks and let's break into computers so we can tell people how to fix them. What a great idea. Um, 
we ran into a little bit of difficulty because again, we worked for a, a large government bureaucracy. We worked for an organization that was into hardware. Uh, so we ran into political difficulties. We ran into rules. And when you're a hacker, you don't want to follow rules. The whole idea is to, is to circumvent the rules and work, work our way around things. Um, so I'll go into some details. Those are some of the highlights. Um, we didn't have SANS back then. We didn't have any, any, any sources to go through, so we had to come up with our methodologies. And you know, interestingly enough, the methodologies that we came up with, there's kind of a right way to go about doing this. They more or less exist onward today. Again, we weren't necessarily the first in the, in the world to be doing this, but we were figuring it out as we went along working at NSA. Um, back in the day, we called it recon. We'd go out and sort of figure out what our target was and learn as much as we could about them. Uh, these days, we kind of call it OSINT. So the names have changed, but the things that we do were sort of, we figured out, yeah, this is the way you do it. Um, what we didn't have, and this is what was interesting when I was putting together this talk, because I was trying to remember what were the tools that we had back then. And I had to distinguish when I was at NSA and when I left, and because I, I, I kept doing pen testing and red teaming for several years afterwards out in the, in the private sector. Um, so things that you guys take for granted today, the tools that you're using all the time, the things that you're learning about at, at conferences like B-Sides, we didn't have all that. Imagine a world without Google. Does anybody remember a world without Google? Do you remember when you used to have a conversation with people, you know, like you're out at a restaurant and you're like, what was the name of that guy in that one movie? What was the name of that movie? Now you can just Google it. I mean, we, all the information's out there. It's amazing. We didn't have that back then. Um, so let me share a little bit about the trade craft that we had back then. I think this is interesting from an historical context, and I also want sympathy from you guys for how hard we had it back then, because we had to hack you know, 10 miles every day uphill in the snow type of thing. Um, but I, I need to give a disclaimer, and that is um, one, of the, one of the things that we dealt with working at NSA and working in a classified organization is that anything we did in, in terms of a target system had to be classified at the level of the classification of the target system. So if we were looking at a top secret network, if a top, se top secret system, anything that we did had to be leveled, <coughs> labeled top secret. Not, doesn't matter what it was, it had to be labeled top secret because of what we were targeting. So my disclaimer is that I'm not telling you about what we used back then I'm telling you about what was available to be used back then. You all with me? Yep. Okay. Um, we had sniffers back then. Anybody, know, anybody still use network sniffers? I mean, it's all software now. Back then, it was hardware. And it was on. It was. It, it was a machine that you'd plug into old networks with cables that you've never heard of, and uh, protocols that you've never heard of. And they were 30 or 40, 50 pounds, so they'd be on a cart, and we'd have to wheel them to the computer room and things like that. So yeah, we had sniffers. Um, we had a vulnerability scanning tool. One of the first ones came out, it's called Satan. Anybody ever use Satan? Remember Satan? A few people that are older. Um, I'm also happy to be a co-host on a podcast, a webcast called Security Weekly. We got to interview the guys back in December that wrote Satan, uh, Vitsa Venema and Dan Farmer. Uh, I have few fanboy moments because most of the people that I look up to are <laughs> either literally no longer with us or they're hard to track down or they've moved on to other things. So uh, if you get a chance to go out and, and, and watch this episode, it was, it was pretty cool to hear them talk. It was, like I said, it was one of my few fanboy moments. Oh, another date. Anybody? November 6th, 1993. Anybody ever hear of Bug Track? Bug track was a, a mailing list of people that would write about bugs, vulnerabilities that they found. It was one of the early forms of vulnerability disclosure. People would write about all sorts of different things. So one of our sources of, we're looking at a target, they're running such and such a system, let's go look at bug track. Um, this is an example. Uh, you know, somebody writing about a vulnerability. It would come in an email. You, you could get it as they came, you could get it in digests. Uh, eventually people, you know, like our, our friend this morning, Jason, figured out how to archive them and make them searchable. 
uh, but this was a very key resource uh, for us back in the early days. Uh, one of the other resources was something called uh, computer emergency response teams. If they saw stuff out in the wild, they would write about it. They would report on hacker activity or it looks like people are exploiting this or that vulnerability and they'd write about it. Um, is anybody actually reading this small print while I'm looking at it and get what it is? This is a cert advisory that was issued on July 4th, 1996 about a movie that came back out, out back then, Independence Day where they, they wrote a cert advisory about how the alien operating system was vulnerable to attack. So we had a sense of humor even back then. Other examples of open source collection that we had back then, uh, we had FAQs. We had, uh, basically in the early days of the internet, it was mostly colleges and universities and research agencies that had large mainframes with large databases and there was these rudimentary search tools they were connected to various uh, combinations of these databases out there. So Archie, anybody ever use Archie? A few people, good. Um, <coughs> DNS information used to be pretty much out openly available if you didn't know how to configure your router and nobody did back then. So you would, you would get uh, domain information out, who is internet, and you would look up all sorts of things, go for another search engine. Uh, before Google, there was AltaVista. Anybody remember AltaVista? This was one of the first kick-ass search engines out there. We used to swear by it. Uh, Mosaic was replaced by Netscape. Any Netscape fans out there? Isn't this a fun stroll down memory lane? <laughs> and don't you understand now why I hate Jason? Because I'm like, he's probably got all this stuff and so much more cooler graphics. So I got to go back and redo this whole talk. Yahoo used to be Yahoo before it became Yahoo. It used to be a decent search engine. When it first came out, one of the things that you did, I don't know if it's on here. Um, again, I need another graphic. One of the features of Yahoo is you could click on a link and it was like a random, it would just take you someplace. Because in the early days, people were just starting to put up websites about anything and, and they wanted everybody to connect. So you could just click on this sort of roulette. Let's play internet roulette and see where it takes you. Not suitable for work, let me tell you. Um, <laughs> The way we would acquire targets back in the day, um, before there was even something like, you know, what do we take for granted today, Nmap. I realized that Nmap hadn't come out yet when I was NSA, and I had forgotten about this, but we used to use something called Strobe. Pop quiz, anybody, well first, does anybody remember Strobe? Does anybody remember using Strobe? So this is a question for three or four people. Uh, I realized this when I was putting this talk together, why I knew this person's name, but, but the author of Strobe is none other than Julian Assange. Oh, wow. And when I, when I was, you know, because I was going and looking at what are the tools, when did they first come out, and I'm like, oh yeah, Julian Assange, because when you used to launch it, it was command line, it would pop up a little window, or I guess it would scroll down. It was, this is Strobe version whatever written by Julian Assange. I was like, that's why I know the guy's name. Anyway, that's my, my uh, brain, you know, mental brain, old age moment. Um, that's really small print. Uh, back in the day, we didn't have network masking. Everything was a registered IP address, IPv4. So we would look at targets and see what kind of address space they own. And there was places where you could look up class A's, B's, and C's, all shot down to the individual IP address, all internet reachable. So we would go out and look at the databases to find out, find our targets. Um, NS lookup, uh, anybody use that anymore? Most of what we did back then was Unix utilities, Unix tools. Um, we had things for mapping networks because uh, it was important to find out what was on the network. Um, another date, anyone? I won't bore you with the suspense. A little thing called crack came out. 1991, anybody know what crack is? Password crack is. <laughs> Not that kind of crack. Password cracker. Password cracker, that's right. Um, back in the day, you, again, this was mostly Unix systems. Passwords were kept in a file called password in, in the directory Etsy. And uh, this little thing will work. Not that you can see the laser, but you get the, you get the username, you get the password, 
uh, what their user level was and so on and all sorts of other things, what their default login account was. This is a real empty password file that I found in an archive that I still have access to. Um, so I blanked out the name. But uh, that's what you used to be able to pretty much world readable. You could steal it, you could run crack and start guessing passwords. Of course, passwords are not an issue anymore. That we've solved that problem. <laughs> um, one of the big techniques for breaking into systems back then was something called set UID, which is on a Unix system, when a program runs, it's gonna run at the permission level of who owns the file, which very often was root. And one of the common techniques for breaking into Unix systems, it was to try to figure out a program that you could get it to crash or halt execution, and it would dump you out into a shell of the ownership of what it was running under, which was very often root, and that was done by using a, what was called a set user ID uh, flag. So, in, don't want to bore you with the details. Common method of if you could just crash an application, you were automatically in. You would get the root shell. So that's just an overview of some of the things that we were dealing with back at, back in the day. Um, I mentioned that we ha we we had issues with bureaucracy. We had issues with uh, the sensitivity of what we were doing. Um, NSA, whether you believe it or not, uh, takes, takes the law very seriously. And NSA operated under this thing called the charter, and the charter is still classified, so I can't show it to you. But what the charter essentially says, and, and this is all before 9-11 and the Patriot Act, so just bear with me, because the world has changed. But the way we were operating at the time was NSA does not do what NSA does to US citizens. And we took that very seriously. And because we were doing this thing, ethical hacking, breaking into the good guys, that technically violated NSA's charter. So initially we were told, don't do that. But then they said, and the, the, the they is management and the lawyers, they're like, well, there's a way to do it, but we need to figure out a way to do it and do it efficiently. Um, oh, and another date. Anyone? A lot of things happened in 1991. Uh, previous speaker had his PGP key up there. This is when PGP came out. Pretty good privacy. Anybody use PGP? GPG? New PG? Variations of it? Another fanboy moment. I got to meet Phil Zimmerman, the guy that wrote PGP last <coughs> fall. And I had to tell him a story. And if you can indulge me, I'll tell you the story really quickly. Um, there was a time when NSA looked at PGP and said, of course, let me back up. PGP initially was, uh, got Phil Zimmerman in trouble because uh, crypto material back in the day was considered materiel, which, was, which is a fancy word for munitions and, and bullets and, 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 and armament and stuff like that. And so it couldn't be exported. And of course, PGP could be everywhere because the internet was everywhere. Um, so he was getting in trouble for that. At NSA, we, we were in the habit of producing all the crypto and all the crypto equipment for all of our customers, which was the military. We had our customer come to us one day and say, why are we spending millions of dollars on this clunky device that you guys are building when we could use this PGP thing and encrypt our email for free? So an edict went out from senior management. Everybody stopped what they're doing. Everybody's got to work on trying to find an attack on PGP. And there's a couple guys that, that put their heads together and came up with an attack on PGP. And they were paraded around. They were treated like rock stars. They were given all sorts of parades within the hallowed halls of NSA, which is kind of weird. Um, they got all sorts of cash awards. They, they were wined and dined. You know, they, we were all geeks and nerds, and it was a very conservative organization. So I think they had a luncheon. But that was the equivalent of <laughs> being paraded. Um, some months later, they eventually started doing a brown bag lunch series for you know, those peons that you know, we just worked with the guys and we wanted to hear the details of their attack. So I went to this brown bag lunch one day and the guys give them the talk about what they did. And what they did was they took a, a document, uh, I want to say back in the day, uh, it wasn't Word, I think it was WordStar, and they found some unused bytes in this document and they inserted some code into this document that if they sent this uh, document to somebody by email and got them to click on the attachment and open it, it would execute this code. Again, does any of this sound familiar? This is like 1995, okay? Um, 
this code that they ex executed would copy the PGP key rings into a file and send it back out on the next email. So what are we talking about? It's a phishing attack. And it's, it, and it's you know, malware, if you will. It's a Trojan, if you will. Um, but I'm listening to the guy talk, and I'm like, well, wait a minute. That's not an attack against PGP at all. That's, you just stole the key, wh which is legitimate. That's what you do a lot of times in cryptography. But the question I asked him then was, wouldn't that work against our stuff? And the guy's like, well, mm, yeah. I said, so what's the big deal? He said, well, our job was to find an attack against PGP. And he just sort of stuck it there. Uh, anyway, that's the, an example of the politics of NSA at the time and, and the governance. Um, needless to say, to my knowledge, and I don't know because I haven't been there in over 20 years, PGP has not been broken. So who knows? There's a lot of smart people there. So I told you again, top secret. The stuff that I'm sharing with you is top secret. But I am going to reveal to you one of our primary attack tools. That remember, this is top secret, so just keep it within this room and the video recording. Let that sink in a minute. The ping command. We had the lawyers look at the ping command. They said, well, what is it, what is it and what does it do? And we had to explain at a somewhat technical level how ICMP works and what ping actually does. And in case you don't know, ping is just simply a packet that goes out and says, is anybody listening? Is anybody alive? Are you there? And if you're alive as a system, you come back and say, yeah, I'm here. I'm alive. What the lawyers decided was because we were targeting a system and we were launching something that would elicit a response, it fit the definition that they had at the time of an active attack. And so therefore, the ping command is a top secret cyber weapon. Used by <laughs> so that wasn't working for us. So you know, if we wanted to target a system, we had to go through all sorts of levels of management to get permission. Everybody had to approve of it. And you know, we were like four or five levels deep in management. And it had to go up the chain and down the chain. It would take weeks to get permission to run a ping command. That wasn't working for us. So we had to talk to the lawyers. Um, we tried to figure out a way to make this all work. And the original concept was basically the lawyer said, well, why don't you just show us all your techniques ahead of time and we'll sort of evaluate it and pre-approve them. So when you get a job, uh, you just you know, tell us we're going to do attack X, Y, and Z and technique Z, R, W, and do a little this and a little that. And of course, we tried to explain to them, well, it doesn't exactly work that way because you don't really know what you're going to use until you see what you got. That's the whole point of reconnaissance. You know, what, 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 are, what is the system uh, listening to in, in terms of services? You know, what are you up against? We don't know until we get there. You have to kind of start probing and doing stuff to figure out to tailor what your attacks are. So what we ended up deciding to do, and for some reason I volunteered to do it, but I think because I have a, a brother that's a lawyer and I felt like I could talk to lawyers and nobody else in the group wanted to really talk to lawyers, I decided to take it on a weekly project of meeting with the lawyers and just going over tools and techniques. It was a lot of fun because we abused him on a re very regular basis because he had no idea. So we were going right under his nose, mostly me, uh, putting back doors into his system. Uh, if anybody knows, uh, well, I'm not going to go into detail. But anyway, we met weekly, and I called it tool time. It was a time where I'd meet with the lawyers and talk to them about all the different tools and techniques. I'm checking time because i gotta, I got to fly. Sorry for talking fast. Um, word got out very quickly. We were doing this for internal networks uh, initially. We were doing it for military classified systems. And uh, this is actually a, a, a report that came out two years after I left NSA. But it's actually pretty factual about stuff that I was working on. Um, and I don't remember how it came about, but at some point it came about that some unclassified networks came to us and said, we want you to do a, a security assessment, a vulnerability assessment of our internet presence. Uh, namely, the Department of Justice came to us and they said, we want you to look at our internet presence. Well, it's an unclassified system. NSA doesn't look at unclassified systems. At the time, that was the responsibility of NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology. But it was well known at the time that NIST had no capability. So when NIST would get these responses, they would routinely come back to NSA anyway because NSA had the capability 
and you know the dance began. So I, I took on this, you know, how do we figure out how to make this all work? The first thing I was told was, well, it sort of has to be a favor from one cabinet level position to another. So we had to figure out, uh, you know, get the um, Secretary of, what is it, in the Department of Justice, Attorney General, uh, to write a, a message to basically the Secretary of Defense, but it was actually sent to the, the person that was responsible for the internet at that point, C3I was Command, Control and Communications and Intelligence. Um, so this is a letter that went out uh, signed by Janet Reno, she was the Attorney General at the time. Um, our director responded and said, yeah, we can do it. I mean, you know, this is a months long process. Uh, you'll notice my name, I was listed there as the primary point of contact on the letter from the director on back. This letter had been signed, it had not been sent yet when this happened. Anybody remember this? This was like the first hack of a government website. The DOJ, DOJ website was defaced. I got a call on a Monday morning from my contact at the Department of Justice <coughs> saying, help, we've been hacked. Do something. And I'm like, well, let me see what I can do. I hung up with them. This is a longer story. I'm just giving you the highlights. Called the lawyers and said, this is what happened. We're so close. We've got everything signed, sealed. We just haven't delivered it yet. What do I need to do to get a forensics team down there? And he gave me some criteria. We uh, met the criteria, in my opinion. We, I took a team down, we were doing forensics. We didn't know what forensics was really at the time. There was no guides about forensics. We were there for about two and a half days when I got a phone call from somebody back at the pit saying, shit's hit the fan, you guys gotta drop what you're doing and come back now. So somewhere along the line, we'd stepped on somebody's toes and somebody got very upset that we were NSA working on an unclassified system and, aren't, and you know, don't you know about the charter and all, it, it became this big, huge mess. And uh, you know, a positive outcome was later on, I became a contributing uh, author, editor for one of the first SAM uh, incident handling documents that came out. Because you know, we didn't know what to do at the time. And what they had done at the time, back in those days when you had a web server, you were running it on your own server in your own network, in your own closet. And uh, when they got hacked, what the IT people did at the time at the DOJ was pull the plug and wipe the thing and rebuild it. All evidence gone. So we didn't really get too far from forensics, but we learned lessons about what not to do in terms of uh, if you any, ever want to do any kind of forensics. Again, a longer story, um, but the result was we got in so much trouble. I was put on double secret probation. They tried to fire me. I had to go through internal security investigations and everybody I was interviewed, everybody that interviewed me, when I told them the story, they said, that's it? You just tried to help? I'm like, yeah, I just tried to help. So the upshot was we all left. Most of us left. Um, the pit to this day, I can tell you, was six people. There's only one other person that's out in the, in the private sector. Like that? I forgot I had that in here. We're the pit. Uh, Ron Gola, the founder and CEO of Tenable Network Security, he was an original member of the pit. Two of the members of the pit are still at NSA, and uh, two more are out in the private sector, but they, they choose to remain anonymous. So the upshot of all this is, uh, you know, the majority of us left, but shortly thereafter, this date, and I won't, I won't even ask what it is, you think back to that book, Dark Territory, I showed you chapter four, Eligible Receiver. Eligible Receiver happened in June of 1997, about a, almost a year after I left NSA, and it was the first joint, everybody's getting hacked by NSA, the entire military. Uh, it was originally planned, to, I think, to be like a two-week exercise, and they halted it in like a day and a half because they won. They, they, they overran everything. Uh, interestingly enough, there was, uh, it wasn't last fall, it was the fall of 2017, they held a symposium at the University of Maryland, University College, I believe, where they pulled together a bunch of the masterminds of eligible receiver and they did a whole panel discussion. They, at the time on their website, had a video that had actually been produced by NSA shortly after eligible receiver that talked about the whole thing. It was like a 25 minute video and they redacted it down to like nine minutes. 
it was up on the web. I, I watched it, but I didn't think to grab it. Uh, but I, I think Ron has it, he told me. So one of these days I'll get a hold of it. But uh, I think that website is still good. You can at least go and I think hear the, the, the panel discussion that they had talking about eligible receivers. You know, surprise, surprise, uh, the government was vulnerable to attack and, and some guys that uh, were not members of the pit uh, you know, were able to kind of run roughshod over pretty much all of the DOD networks very quickly and to the point where, okay, we gotta call the exercise because people are starting to load guns and stuff like that. It's an interesting <laughs> epilogue. Um, another date, September 1st, 1997. This is actually when NMAP came out which I, th I thought was fascinating because I was like, you know, I've been using MMAP for so long and I realized, well, I didn't use it when I was at NSA. I used that Julian Assange thing called Stroke. NMAP's so much better. Anyway, members of the pit, we still get together every once in a while. Uh, we try to meet like once or twice a year. The guys that still work at NSA, they like to bring us gifts. You can get these gifts at the uh, gift shop of the National Cryptologic Museum, not to give it another plug, but you can get the special bat pen that, get, that puts out the NSA seal, which is what's shining on the coffee mug there. You can get NSA secret sauce. Who doesn't want to have NSA secret sauce? <laughs> um, so, apologize for going fast. There's so much more stories to tell. I was just trying to kind of give you the highlights in, in the time allotted. Um, if you want to you know, learn more about stories, if you want to keep listening to me, as I said, I am a, one of the co-hosts on Security Weekly. Um, because of my fame of being an NSA uh, pen tester, I got to be part of a, a card game that's actually a, a fundraiser for a group called Hack for Kids, so teaching the next generation about hacking. It's a game called Freaker Life, Freaker.life. I encourage you to get cards. I got a few copies of the decks here. I can show them to you. So I'm one of the face cards, what they call in hackronism, and a, a bunch of us got together last year at DEF CON, got our picture taken. Uh, recently, a book came out called Tribe of Hackers. Anybody heard of Tribe of Hackers? happen to be in it. Um, and if you happen to have a copy of the book, I know some people do, I'd be happy to autograph it for you. You know, read my chapter. It's a fascinating book. I'm, I'm not even all the way through yet. Uh, I just got new glasses with the new reading bifocal thing and I can actually see the print now because it was killing me before. Um, I give talks and workshops on effective communication that I call the art of the Jedi mind trick and our conference uh, gave me an escort a couple years ago so I consider myself a Jedi master. And I am officially considered a curmudgeon because I'm a member of the cabal of the curmudgeons, which is people that get together with that guy in the sort of off to the left there with the beard. He usually has a bow tie on, Gene Spafford. He wrote that book that I showed you earlier, The Bible on Practical Internet and Unix Security. Uh, so I get to hang out with him. And this is a shot. I was, I was indoctrinated or led into this group of the curmudgeons two years ago at RSA. And in a, in a strange twist of fate, the guy who I have my arm around in the red sweater, that's actually the lawyer that I get to work with at NSA. We've, we've made our peace. <laughs> uh, about out of time, questions, comments? If not now, I'm around all day. Look for me and I'll find a place to put out stickers. Come get stickers from me. Good. Any quis quick questions? That's a no. Oh, wait, one in the back. <laughs> Why did I know Snowden was going to come up? My, uh, my short answer is traitor. I, I'm happy to go into a longer answer, but you have to buy me a drink. Uh, but uh, most of the people that I know that I work with, and I still keep in touch with a lot of people that are former or current NSA people, uh, if, 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 if you knew what they knew, and I don't know all of it, but I suspect that uh, the damage that he did for whatever his intentions were, uh, are, are put, for me, put him in the category of traitor. I will say what he was seeing that he had beefs about or what he was concerned about, I think are legitimate. I just think he went about it the wrong way. A and the reason I, I, I give this talk on the whole thing about the DOJ, uh, when I've given that talk, I call it, I was the first Snowden. Because the first time I ever heard of something called the church proceedings, anybody know what the church proceedings are? I'm about to tell you, oh, a couple in the back. Um, the church proceedings came out, uh, came out as a result of Watergate. Strange how history repeats itself. There was this investigation that went on for months and months, produced a big lengthy report. Sound familiar? 
And the, the report essentially said, as a result of investigating Watergate, there's these organizations like the FBI and the CIA and the NSA, they have a whole lot of power but not any real, real regulatory oversight. There's nobody putting any limits on it. So at the, r the result of the church proceedings was this NSA charter that said NSA can only do what NSA does to non-US citizens. NSA can't do what NSA does to US citizens. The first time I ever heard of the church proceedings was when I was getting in trouble and getting my ass screamed by this lawyer in the conference room of the EBI back in 1996. The second time I heard about the church proceedings was when Snowden did his thing and I was hearing reporting on it, and somebody brought up, oh, it's the church proceedings. So, uh, longer answer than I wanted to give. Any other questions? Yes? What's the plus one? This is my uh, spirit animal. <laughs> <laughs> it looks sweet and cuddly, but uh, it's the rage that goes on inside. Another question over here. Yes? Do you recommend the NSA as a place to work today? The question is, would I recommend the NSA as a place to work today? Depends what you want to get out of it, but if you're looking for decent employment, they're certainly changing their mission, they're changing their orientation, the world has changed, um, but they're still hiring as far as I know. And plus you can say, hey, I work at NSA, which someday 20, 30 years from now you can stand up and give talks about it. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. If you have a big ass rate, you always risk that speed up the change? Oh, hell no. <laughs> I mean, we had a we had a motto when I was back in the pit because we like to like upset everything. And when they formed the snack, there was some committee that went off for several weeks and came up with a slogan for the snack. And, and when they came by and they handed us little cards with what it was, we immediately trashed it. And the guy that handed it out was like the one that had come up with it. He got really offended. Uh, but the, the slogan that I came up for NSA at the time was uh, NSA. Yesterday's technology, tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? I know our time is not. All right, thanks a lot, everybody. <laughs>